call the third case on this morning's docket, case number 110325, State of Kansas v. Dickey. May it please the court, Samuel Schreier of the Appellate Defender Office appearing on behalf of the defendant appellant, Jeff Dickey. Your Honor, may I please reserve three minutes of rebuttal argument? Three minutes is granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Unless this court would desire otherwise, uh, I'd like to start argument today with issue number two in the brief and the petition. Uh, that is the Apprendi illegal sentence issue. I think resolution of that issue is uh, relatively straightforward given this court's ruling in State v. Dickey 1. Uh, as this court is aware, in the three cases from which Mr. Dickey appeals, the district court elevated his prison sentences by scoring a 1992 in-state burglary adjudication as a person felony. In denying Mr. Dickey relief, the Court of Appeals held that this did not make his sentence illegal, or sentences illegal. Uh, this court's holding in State v. Uh, Dickey No. 1 uh, invalidates that holding, we believe. Dickey, Dickey No. 1 was a direct appeal from the, I believe it was a felony theft, and utilized his um, criminal history and he challenged that on the direct appeal. Um, this is distinguished from that because this, these cases that he's appealing from here, the sentences were imposed and they're as a result of a probation revocation. Isn't that right? It, isn't that a significant difference here? Uh, and, and if it's not, why not? Well, Your Honor, uh, I don't think it's a significant difference based on a number of other cases which this court has decided. Uh, so the first preliminary issue is, can an illegal sentence be corrected in a probation revocation appeal? I think it's clear that that can happen because an illegal sentence may be corrected at any time by statute. Uh, the next question I think that the state raises in its briefing is whether race judicata uh, would apply to the facts of Mr. Dickey's cases. Uh, I don't believe that it would because these issues have not been previously litigated. Uh, this court has applied res judicata to illegal sentence claims uh, when the issues have been previously litigated. Uh, for example, in a direct appeal of 1507, a prior motion to correct illegal sentence. Uh, if a sentence has never, if, excuse me, if a claim has not been previously litigated, uh, res judicata doesn't come into play uh, because then this court would not be able to correct an illegal sentence at any time. Uh, the remaining major question, I think, based on the state's briefing is whether we are asking this court uh, to retroactively apply State versus Dickey 1 uh, to this case. And I don't believe that's what we're doing. Uh, what we are asking this court to do today is to find that Mr. Dickey's prison sentences are illegal because of the United States Supreme Court's holding in Apprendi v. New Jersey. Uh, that case was decided in 2000, uh, well before uh, any of these cases came into existence. Uh, Apprendi applies prospectively, uh, and for that reason, we don't think that this appeal uh, has any type of uh, retroactivity concern. Unless this court has any questions on the illegal sentence issue, I would uh, go ahead and move on to the probation revocation issue. Uh, the issue there is whether the district court appropriately exercised its discretion when imposing a probation revocation disposition. Uh, and we would respectfully submit to this court that the court did not. Uh, what happened in this case was the district court ordered Mr. Dickey to serve uh, the sentences uh, which were originally imposed at his sentencing hearings. Uh, we think the record demonstrates that the district court was not aware what the duration of those prison sentences were. And when a district court has an optional sentence uh, that it may impose, 
We believe that a district court must understand what that sentence actually is to appropriately exercise its discretion uh, in deciding whether or not to impose that sentence. Uh, in this particular case, Mr. Dickey had a, an aggregate of 70 months in these three cases that are now on appeal. A district court could have given a 69-month sentence, a 68-month sentence, uh, a two-month sentence if it was so inclined. Uh, and in re deciding that a 70-month sentence was appropriate, uh, I think the court would have had to have known that it was imposing a 70-month sentence. Don't we have to read a lot into um, what is a fairly silent record to draw that conclusion? Because didn't the court say something about, I don't know what the credit for time served is, you'll be given that? Wasn't that the tag in? Yes, sir. If I could get the exact language used by the court. Mr. Dickey asked what his global sentence was going to be uh, after the court made its ruling. And the court's response uh, was, you will receive a journal entry with those sentences and what time you have served will certainly be applies to those sentences. I mean, I, I read that as implying that the trial court didn't want to give him an exact number because at that point the court was not sure what the number of the remaining sentence was because of the credit for time served hadn't been calculated. Your Honor, uh, that's not how I read that statement. How, how I read that, Mr. Dickey specifically asked what his global sentence would be. And if the district court would have said 70 months and you'll receive whatever good time credit you're entitled to, uh, I, I think that would establish that the court knew uh, the duration of Mr. Dickey's sentences. I, I think by deferring to a journal entry that hasn't yet been drafted, uh, it demonstrates that the court uh, was not aware. But your argument is premised on a belief that a, uh, the court in a probation revocation hearing has to redetermine or reassess whether the original sentencing was appropriate. And I don't see that. I see that the issue before the court is, are there uh, extraordinary circumstances that would lead me to reduce the original sentence? Uh, because the appropriateness of the original sentence, that, that train left the station when, uh, when, when we had the sentencing and, and no appeal from it. Did it not? Well, I would respectfully disagree, Your Honor. And I think... At a sentencing hearing, a district court has its hands tied. Uh, it can either grant a durational departure, which requires very specific findings, or it can give a grid sentence. Uh, when you get to a probation revocation uh, proceeding, uh, by statute, uh, a court has unfettered discretion uh, as as far as what sentence it wants to give. The oh, only no, thing it's no, no, no. It can impose the original sentence or a lesser sentence. That's not unfettered discretion. Well, yes, and Your then, Honor. Yeah. Uh, but any lesser sentence uh, doesn't require any factual findings from the court. It can be for any reason that the court thinks is valid. Uh, and the only thing that it can be reviewed for is an abuse of discretion. Is the district court sentence unreasonable? Uh, and uh, for that reason, I think the district court needed to put itself in the position of deciding whether a 70-month prison sentence for these three cases was the sentence that it actually felt was appropriate to give. Uh, without knowing that there was a 70-month sentence, I don't think the court was in a position to reflect as to whether that would be the most appropriate sentence. Why well, wasn't it incumbent on the uh, defense counsel to get the uh, uh, findings it needed to bring this issue? Um, if, if we believe, as Justice Lukert has indicated, that the record is ambivalent about what the district judge actually knew, how can we just presume that uh, the judge didn't know? Uh, 
when actually our presumption is that the judge knows all the facts necessary to support its ruling. And if that were the fact, why wasn't it incumbent on the defendant to, to make that record, to, to support your argument on appeal? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, my response to that would be that any sentence can be reviewed for an, pardon, uh, unless statutorily barred, any sentence can be reviewed for an abuse of discretion. And I don't think that this court's case law uh, would support the position that uh, an appellant is required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the district court abused its discretion, uh, but rather that there is a uh, high likelihood that the district court... Uh, but you only win if we accept the fact that the district court did not, in fact, know what the original sentence was. That's, That's right. the only way you win. And I'm asking, why isn't it up to you to bring it to us in a posture where we can say, yes, the record indicates that fact to be true? When, when it's ambiguous, and we have a rule that uh, when a judge makes a ruling, we presume that judge uh, found all the facts necessary. Your Honor, uh, I would argue that we have established that the court uh, was unaware of the 70 month sentence based on the comments made by the court. The, the one sentence. The one sentence that says. Do you have anything you other than that? You will receive the journal entry of what, with what those sentences were and what time you have served will certainly be applied. Thank you. That's it. That's your whole argument. Okay. You think the record on appeal is sufficient? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Unless this court has any further questions. I, I have I a few questions if I could take you back to the first issue. Yes, Your Honor. Um, just to clarify this in my own mind, I think, uh, which sentence are you alleging was illegal in this case? Uh, the original sentence at sentencing, not the probation revocation. Okay. So I guess the question that, that I have is, are, are we in the right case, essentially? And this is an appeal from the probation revocation. Your Honor, uh, Cor I, that's correct, right? That's yeah. correct, Your Honor. Okay, so we are not. I mean, e even if just a sort of looking at the form, we are not proceeding under those earlier cases. That's that's right. Well, so even granting that a motion, uh, a illegal sentence, can be corrected at any time, can it be corrected in any case as well? In other words, this is a different case. Well, it's the same case number, it's a different appeal than it would have been from a direct sentencing. Uh, Your Honor, if, if the district court would have had statutory authority to correct an illegal sentence at the probation revocation hearing, uh, which I believe it's pretty clear that it would have, then I don't see a reason why this court would not have, in this appeal, uh, similar authority to correct the illegal sentence. Okay. And your uh, that makes sense. Uh, and just explain to me why the lower court would have had the authority to correct those earlier illegal sentences, assuming for the purposes of a question that they were illegal. Uh, simply because they can be corrected at any time. Um, I, I don't believe a formal motion needs to be filed, Your Honor. Okay. Any further questions? Doesn't 223504 contemplate a motion? I'm trying to. We have a statute that deals with the correction of an illegal sentence, do we not? Yes, Your Honor. And the statutory language is an ill. I'll have to look up the exact statute. Well, I can get that on rebuttal. Yeah. That's, that's fine. It's there, whatever it says. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you, Counsel. May it please the court, the state appears by Assistant Solicitor General Natalie Chalmers. Ms. 
I'm going to slaughter her last name again. Op Opponent and I are going to split argument. I'm going to argue the, what I'm going to call the Dickey issue, and she is going to argue the probation issue. Under the Kansas statutes, it is clear, under the KSGA, the Dickey was legally sentenced. His sentence is authorized by the sentencing statutes. The question in this case is what relief is available since Dickey won. This court found that the Kansas sentencing scheme, as it relates to pre-1993 burglaries, violates essentially Apprendi. But we also held that it was an illegal sentence. We did have... And that it did not conform to the applicable statu statutes. That's the holding of Dickey 1, right? The holding of Dickey 1 seems to be that, but I don't understand that. The statute says if you want to figure out how you score pre-1993, you look to well, you have two. It facts. seems to me you have two different ways to, to win this argument. One is to, to come back and tell us we got Dickey 1 wrong, right. and the other is to distinguish it. And I'm, I'm, trying I'm more interested in the latter. <laughs> okay. Um, how can we distinguish Dickey 1 from this case? It strikes me the, the only real difference is that, as I think Justice Rosen uh, intimated this earlier, that this, it, it, this is essentially a collateral attack as opposed to hearing these sentences on direct appeal. Correct. This is not a direct appeal. This is Why a does that matter? Attack. Well, it seems like Neil which is the case that this court relied on Dickey, seems to adopt the scope of the federal, when a federal collateral attack is allowed. Because Neil allowed an attack on a prior conviction because there was no counsel. And we don't typically allow collateral attacks through motion to practice legal sentences. I'm hoping this court isn't going to allow collateral attacks for if counsel was ineffective in the prior 1993 burglary conviction. Um, so if we're taking the scope of when it would be a permissible federal attack, it's clearly not here. The federal courts have unanimously held that this is not permissible through a federal collateral attack. And we should read that same limitation into the motion to correct legal sentence statute. We'd um, have to read it in. We'd have to read language into it. I mean, I the plain language is an illegal sentence can be corrected at any time. Yes, and historically, this court has never said that an illegal sentence means a constitutional error. The only error here is a constitutional error. It's an extension of Apprendi. So this court has kind of baffled the state a little bit in that we now you are kind of changing the definition of a legal sentence by saying that, oh, now it is illegal because it's Apprendi, but in no other case has Apprendi been extended through a motion to correct a legal sentence. Elaine hasn't yet been extended. Any of the other Apprendi violations with upper departure statutes, we haven't had those extended through a motion to correct a legal sentence. This court is allowed to set limits and has. It has defined a motion to correct a legal sentence and what is an illegal sentence. And it could say that it has to be an illegal sentence that was raised in direct appeal. You're, we're going to hold the scope to the federal so we don't open the door to basically any time you want to attack criminal history, that we're going to allow you to attack your counsel as being ineffective or anything like that. And we're going to limit it to the what federal relief would be available. Let me ask a question I asked mm -hmm. defense counsel. Uh, do you agree with defense counsel's assertion that in this case, the lower court would have been able to correct, assuming for purposes of the question that it's an illegal sentence, would the lower court have been able to correct that sentence in the in the original cases to which the court was reinstating after revoking probation? Or would that would the, would the defendant have to have gone through some other procedure, i.e. file a motion? The defendant should have at least filed a motion, in my opinion. The defendant should have to file a motion saying my sentence is illegal, and that would start it. I know this court has historically accepted motion to correct legal sentences for the first time on appeal, so I'm not sure that it does me any good to say that he didn't file a motion. Um, and another way to limit or clarify Dickey to the extent that this court is willing to do so, there were no actual factual findings made by the district court here. There's no actual apprentice violation in the state's mind. The district court didn't say, hey, this pre-1993 burglary really was a person home. We know it's a home, I think, based on the facts, or in, as in the original Court of Appeals brief, that were pretty clear that it was actually a home here. 
But the district court didn't make any of that, and it's because he didn't object. The state would urge a rule basically where the defendant should have to object at sentencing before there was an actual even found to be an apprendee violation, because there was no factual finding here, so there couldn't have been an apprendee violation. And again, the state's struggling with the fact that constitutional violations, which is the only thing present here because the KSGA permits the sentence that Dickey received, are not typically motions to correct an illegal sentence. So the state would urge this court what, to... Could sorry? we back up just a moment? Yes. What factual determination would the court have made in this case about the bur pre-1993 burglary? The, it, it doesn't matter, does it? I mean, it, it, all pre-19... According to Dickey 1 and the Court of Appeals Dickey case, all pre-1993 burglaries, by virtue of the fact that there's... Uh, of the elements that are different, are now non-person felonies. It, it, there's no factual determination to be made, is there? If he objects, then the court would have to actually go to the part of the statute that says you have to look to the facts. If he doesn't object, the court doesn't take that step. So yes, if he objects, it's a non-person felony. Because we can't, per Dickey 1, look right. to the facts. But so if he doesn't you're, object... You're saying there's no objection, so there's nothing. Okay. Yeah, the court doesn't make a finding. It looks at the PSI. It's essentially a stipulation that, yes, this is a person felony. And you can. Apprendi error can be harmless. You can waive. And if you can waive Apprendi and you can... Apprendi but can you can stipulate to, a, to an error of law? I mean, if, if the PSI says that, it's just wrong. It's, it's, that's a legal error. There's no, again, there are no findings of fact required. You can't stipulate to an error of law, but you can waive the requirement that there be findings. You can say, I'm not going to make the state prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there's a burglary. And when they don't object, that's essentially what they do. They've said, state, we're not requiring We're not objecting that. to an erroneous classification. Correct. And that erroneous classification is erroneous as a matter of law, not as a matter of any facts. Sure. But again, and I'm just repeating myself, the district court didn't make any factual findings because there was no objection. So there couldn't have been an apprentice violation. And hypothetically, if there was a violation, the state could try and do something. Well, to I mean, prove. but isn't that what Dickey, what our Dickey one said? I mean, it's all premised on Apprendi, yes, but really it's illegal because it's a misclassification. Right? It's a misclassification. I mean, the misclassification springs out of Apprendi. Yes. But it doesn't necessarily, as you point out, actually require an Apprendi violation. But it's just simply a misclassification of a prior crime. But it wouldn't be a misclassification if the, those facts were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. There can only be the Apprendi error to make it the misclassification if those facts were not actually proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Another way the court could go about this is... I know there's a debate of whether or not it's a new rule or not a new rule. Well, now wait. I, I want to yeah. go back to the proof beyond a reasonable yes. doubt. Uh, under, the, uh, under the scheme where uh, being a dwelling was not an element of the crime, uh, then we've interpreted our statutes to compare the elements of that crime to the current crime or the crime at the time of the current uh, conviction. And so just because you proved it was a dwelling doesn't change the character of the prior offense, does it? It doesn't change the character of the prior offense, but the prior offense in many of the complaints that are from pre-1993 said it was indeed a residence. When you plead to them, then you would plead to all the facts in the complaint. And I know this is hard for me to make that analysis because Dick, but it wasn't an element of the offense it wasn't the element if it's it, you know you can right. plead to a lot of things that are irrelevant to your current prosecution and and that doesn't that doesn't change the character of the, of the offense the character of the offense was a non-person when you look at the statutes uh, at, at the time of the current conviction regardless of the the quantum of proof you, you can't change the character of the prior crime from a non-person to a person, and that's based on how we've interpreted our statutes. But our statute would allow us to do that. 
because of the way they allow us to score the, pers- the pre-1983. Our statute gives us a mechanism in order to it's make it... It's that mechanism that violates Apprendi, though. But That's only the if there are factual findings. Right, but the, that mechanism is constitutionally uh, deficient. So at that point, we just go back, and as I understand, I think that's what these questions are driving at, we just go back to our statutory interpretation, which is, this is not a person felony. And that's just a pure legal question as to the classification of the prior crime. It has, it really has nothing to do with Apprendi. What, what, the problem with Apprendi is it takes away the mechanism that the legislature tried to give the state. Right to shift it from non-person to person. Right. Okay. And so this, I'm sorry, I see I'm out of time. Could I make a couple more points? I'll give you 60 seconds to wrap up. Okay. Um, We could also say race judicata, that he should have to raise it. Um, We could say um, that this, I don't know for sure that this is a new rule, isn't a new rule. I know the Ninth Circuit has basically said that desk camp is not actually a constitutional requirement. I cited that case, Azell, in my 609 letter, that because it is an interpretation of the statutory, or it's a statutory interpretation, how closely they have to match. And I know we will be arguing that when, in the future about how we're going to score out-of-state prior convictions. The state would just respectfully request that you find a way to limit Dickey to direct appeals. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Thank you, Council. Is there another argument? Oh, yes, if, if there's time, yes, sure. Well, we've split the time. There was 10 minutes for the first presentation, then you have five. Thank you, sir. Right. Your Honor, Annie Infinin, Fort Sling, Sustainable County Attorney's Office. We're here today asking that you uphold the ruling of the Court of Appeals in several unpublished cases, including the Dickey matter, that the district court is not required at the probation violation hearing to give an oral pronouncement of the underlying sentence that was previously imposed against the defendant unless it's specifically been modified by McGill. As this court's aware, both McGill and uh, KSA 223716B give the court the authority to issue a lesser sentence at a probation violation uh, hearing. That was not the case here. In this particular instance, Mr. Dickey uh, appeared before the court. He had three cases on a probation violation hearing. He had a fourth case that he was presently being sentenced on. The Um, Appellant describes that the district court essentially had a knee-jerk reaction and was blindly imposing sentences of unknown duration upon the uh, defendant when it failed to give him any relief and reduce his sentence, um, or that it did not know the exact sentence that was being imposed upon the, the defendant on that day. State would classify that as a mischaracterization of what would have happened. Specifically, the question that was asked by the defendant on that day was, may I ask how much time I'm looking at, Your Honor? That's not asking what globally what his underlying sentences was. That can be interpreted as the state's interpreting here is actually the defendant asking how much time left do I have to serve? And that's something where the state would ask for the shield of um, Abasalo to give it the protection there. Um, in Abasalo's courts where a judge gave a, a sentence at a PV hearing, reduced it from 52 months to 36 months through the 1507 hearing that was associated with that case, the judge um, even announced or testified that it was an error, did not intend to reduce that sentence. The Supreme Court here found that what the intention of the court didn't matter, what the oral pronouncement was, was what mattered. The 36 months was something that was allowed through the guidelines that was the um, sentence for the one of the counts. And this court said, because that was a something that was allowed for the court to do to reduce that sentence, and that oral pronouncement of the, the court at uh, that viol- probation violation hearing would be that the sentence would be reduced to that amount state would argue here that the way that the question was posed to the district court from Mr. Dickey of how much time do I have to serve, that's putting the court into the difficult and complex position of 
looking at jail time credit or other potential factors that may reduce that sentence. The state doesn't look at that as just the question of a global, um, what are my underlying sentences between all of the, the cases that are being served. And the state does not see that as a court abusing its discretion, but more of the protective factor of had there been an error in any of those calculations, the state would have been bound by what the court announced on that particular day. In addition, do you, Counselor, do you, do you um, dispute that in order to exercise discretion, a district court needs to know the facts? In other words, in order to exercise the discretion to impose a lesser sentence, the uh, court should have knowledge of what the original sentence is. I don't know that that's necessarily the, the proper place to have it there, the probation violation hearing. When you're looking at your sentencing, that's where the court is going to take into consideration all the facts of the particular case. Any other, you know, at that point it has a full breadth of the criminal history of the person before but it. And it also can, has constraints. It does. It does have constraints. It has no constraints at the uh, PV hearing. It does not, but what the court does take into consideration at the probation violation hearing is how has that defendant been operating when it's been given that grace of the court of having the opportunity at probation. And that's where the court takes into consideration the reduction of its sentence is has the defendant acted in some way to warrant that additional grace from the court after it's already been given to it. And in this case, it did not. Mr. Dickey came before the court multiple times having durational departures that had been granted. There were restraints from the court as far as you know, sentencing, um, sentencing guidelines, whether or not cases had to be consecutive per, uh, per law, just depending upon how he was sentenced. But those were not factors that the court would need to consider before it at the PV hearing. At that particular point, what the court looks at is the probationer's performance. It has the option to put him back on probation, has the option of imposing jail sanctions, has the options of reducing its sentence. And those decisions are all based upon, or at least in part, largely based upon the defendant's performance on probation. The other factors as far as the global sentence that would be imposed against the defendant, that's not the place for that to come into consideration. That's at sentencing, and that time had already passed for the appeal. If Mr. Dickey was going to be objecting to the, the full amount of, of saying it was an abuse of discretion from the court to impose the, the sentences that it had at sentencing, again, he could have made that argument in some fashion, or at least he made it attempted to after sentencing. The court has the discretion to modify the sentence. It chose not to in this case. There is no statutory law. There's no case law that demands that the court repronounce the full sentences that were imposed. Do we have any questions of counsel? Any further presentation? No, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. You reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> uh, the only uh, point I think that I'm intending to make on rebuttal, it, it's my understanding that at least in the context of a direct appeal, uh, this court has corrected illegal sentences sua sponte. Uh, so that to me would indicate that it's not necessary for a formal motion uh, to have been filed. Uh, beyond that, I'm prepared to uh, waive the remainder of my rebuttal time unless this court has any further questions. I see none. Thank you, counsel. Thank you all for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement.